dear students, today we are discussing about schema theory. Schema theory is one of the cognitive learning theories was firstly introduced in 1932 through the work of British psychologist Sir Frederick, Frederick Burlett and was it was further developed mostly in 1970s by American educational psychologist Richard Anderson. Schema theory describes how knowledge is acquired, processed and organized. The starting assumption of this theory is that very act of comprehension involves one's knowledge of the world. According to this theory, knowledge is a network of mental frames or cognitive constructs called schema. Schemata organize knowledge, uh, knowledge stored in the long term memory. Before go to detail, you can watch a video about the concept. This presentation will go over schema theory or in other words, building mental maps. The past connects to the present. Uh, when we enter into a new learning situation or environment, we use a process of interaction between what we already know and what we want to learn. We are always using what we know to interpret what we don't know. We refer to past knowledge to help learn future knowledge. So think about any new situation that you went to and went into and had no prior knowledge of it. It, it can be rather um, unnerving to enter a new situation like that and not have any prior experience with that. If we can't link new content to something we already know, learning is much more difficult. This becomes even more apparent with online learning. Remember, not all students have experience with online learning and thus they're entering into a new learning situation with no experience to link it to. This is an example of attacking new knowledge without having the proper mental model or map. Read the following paragraph and try to understand it. Had enough time? I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, you should have had enough time to try to read at least half the paragraph. I'm going to move on now. So sit back for a second and try to explain to yourself what this paragraph was about. Does it make sense? When you read it, did it become clear to you what the author was trying to um, get across? Uh, when I first read it, I had, I had no clue. A schema or a mental map, even though you recognize every word in, this par in, the, in the paragraph that we just read, you probably don't understand it. This passage is used to demonstrate the power of schemas or mental maps. Um, the name for the way we construct mental maps of information in long-term memory is a schema. The passage is using a schema or mental map that most people have not experienced or would have or would even imagine experiencing. So you read it uh, to you, um, you find nothing in your long-term memory that you can use to interact with the information in the passage. But if I give you a schema for the passage, I guarantee that passage will be much easier to understand. So he, uh, to the left, you will find a schema or mental map that can be used to interpret the paragraph of nonsense you just read. Take a moment and study the picture. Okay, you've had a moment to study the picture. Let's move back to the paragraph and see if the paragraph makes more sense based upon what you know about this picture. So after viewing the mental map or schema, read the paragraph again. Okay. The text should make more sense now. By giving that image, that provided a mental, mental map for you to actually digest, interpret, and learn um, what this passage meant. 
So what does it all mean? Understanding something depends on our having experiences stored in long-term memory that can interact with the new information presented in a learning situation. So linking our, our prior knowledge or our old knowledge to what we are about to learn is always the first type of thinking we use when acquiring new knowledge. And if we don't have prior knowledge of something, it makes it much harder to try to interpret and digest new material. So, how to build mental maps with online courses. First, label descriptive information with your learning content. You'll see on my week one interactive strategies, I have a small paragraph that actually outlines what this week is about. So it gives a student a mental map about what they're going to be doing. Use descriptive words to name learning objects. You'll see in my student lounge folder, I have it called Let's Support Each Other. Just using the word support, tells a student that this is a place to receive help from each other. Provide a list of deliverables or learning goals before each unit. Um, the learning goals you see below allow the student to preload the content and what they need to do to learn that content. And these tasks that you or learning goals that you line out should be linked or lined up with your unit of instruction. Use formative tests or quizzes. It can be as simple as five questions that provide a quick assessment on key learning goals. This serves to preload content for students and also allows students to measure their own knowledge of the topic. Um, you see below is a starting point survey. It's a small survey that will basically um, give the student a pre-assessment on basic biological knowledge. It lets the student know where they stand with the content and also allow them to kind of preload the content in their um, mental map so when they actually are presented with the content they'll be able to refer back to this um, pretest within their mental map. And finally, build a story or narrative with your learning content. You'll see below I have a welcome to my module too. I try to create a narrative story that allows a student to have a beginning and an end. Whenever you approach new, new material, um, students always look for the beginning or the entry point, and they look for the middle, and they look for the end, which usually is the assessment piece. Um, and I always try to line up an essential question for the module. In other words, what do I want my students to be able to do or know when they are done with my course? What are the essentials? And Fini, this is the end of this presentation. The term schema is nowadays often used in, used even outside cognitive psychology and it refers to a mental framework of humans used to represent and organize remem uh, remembered information. Schemata present our personal simplified view over really derived from our experience and prior knowledge. They enable us to recall, modify our behavior concentrate attention on key information or try to predict most likely outco outcome of events. Linguist cognitive psychologists and psycholinguists have used the concept of schema to understand the interaction of key factors affecting the comprehension process. Simply put schema theory states that all knowledge is organized into units. Within these units of knowledge or schemata, it is stored as information. A schema then is generalized description or a conceptual system for understanding knowledge, how knowledge is represented and how it is used. According to this theory, schemata represent knowledge about concepts, objects and the relationships they have with other objects, situations, events, sequence of events, actions and sequence of actions. A simple example is to think of your schemata for a dog. Within that schema, you most likely have knowledge about dogs in general, eye barks, four legs, it has teeth, hair, tails, etc. And probably information about specific dogs such as collies, it has long hair, large uh, or springer spaniels, Le uh, and it has English dog uh, tails, liver and white or black or uh, milly, etc. You may also think of the dogs within the greater context of animals and other living things that is dogs breath, need food and reproduce. 
your knowledge of dogs might also include the fact that they are mammals and thus are warm blooded and bear they are young as opposed to laying eggs. Depending upon your personal experience the knowledge of a dog as a pet uh, demo, uh, uh, domesticated and loyal or as an animal to fear uh, it may be a part of your schema and so, so it goes with the development of a schema. Each new experience incorporates more information into one's schema. What does all this have to do with reading comprehension? Individuals have schemata for everything long before students come to school they develop schemata or units of knowledge about everything they experience. Schemata becomes theories about reality. These theories not only affect the way information is interpreted thus affecting comprehension but also continue to change as new information is received as stated by Romal Hart schemata can represent knowledge at all levels from ideologies and cultural truths to knowledge about the meaning of particular word to knowledge about what patterns excitations are associated with what letters of the alphabet. We have schemata to represent all levels of our experience at all levels, levels of abstraction. Finally, our schemata are our knowledge. All of our generic knowledge is embedded in schemata. The importance of schemata theory to reading comprehension also lies in how the reader uses schemata. This issue has not yet been resolved by research. Although investigators agree that some mechanism activates that those schemata most relevant to the reader's task. Reading comprehension as a cognitive based processing. There are several models based on cognitive processing. For example, uh, the Lee Berg Samuels models of automatic information processing emphasizes internal aspects of attention as crucial to comprehension. Schemata can represent knowledge at all levels from ideologies and cultural truths to knowledge about meaning of particular word to knowledge about what patterns of excitations are associated with what letters of the alphabet. Schemata also expand change in time due to the acquisition of view, new information but deeply installed schemata are inert and slow in changing. This could provide an explanation to why some people live with incorrect or inconsistent beliefs rather than changing them. When new information is retrieved if possible it will be assimilated into existing schemata or related schemata. It will be changed in order to integrate the new information. For example, during schooling process a child learns about mammals and develops corresponding schema. When a child hears that propose is a mammal as well it first tries to fit it into the mammals schema. Its warm blooded air breathing uh, is born with the hair and gives, leave, uh, gives uh, birth. Yet it lives in water unlike most mammals and to and so the mammal's schema has to be accommodated to fit in the new information. Schema theory was partly influenced by unsuccessful attempts in the area of artificial intelligence. Teaching a computer to read natural text or display other human like behavior was the rather unsuccessful since it has shown that it is impossible without quite an amount of information that was not directly included but was inherently present in humans. Research has shown that this inherent information stored in the form of schemata for example uh, content schema uh, it, it, is, it is the prior knowledge about the topic of the text, formal schema it is awareness of the structure of the text, language schema the knowledge of the vocabulary and uh, relationship of the words in text can cause easier or more difficult text comprehension depending on how developed the mentioned schema, how developed mentioned schema are, schemata are and uh, whether they are unsuccess, uh, successfully activated. According to Brown, when reading a text it alone does not carry the meaning, uh, meaning a reader attributes to it. The meaning is formed by the information and cultural and emotional context the reader brings through his schemata 
more than by the text itself. Now you can watch more about schema theory. Andy Johnson, Minnesota State University. We're looking at schema theory, learning, and comprehension. First of all, a schema is an organized knowledge structure like a file folder in your head. It is the classic building blocks of learning and thinking. It's how we organize information. Schema are important, and plural of schema is schemata, by the way, for comprehending, learning, and remembering. It creates the structure that we use to remember stuff, to learn stuff, to organize new information that's coming in. The more schemata that we have, the more developed our schemata are, the easier it is to learn and to comprehend. And I'm talking about comprehending in terms both of reading comprehension, but comprehending new theories, new ideas, new concepts, comprehending as learning. The rich get richer, the poor get poor. The more you read, the more you learn, the more you experience, the easier it is for you to take in and organize more information in learning. Schema are based on your past experiences and your personal experiences are powerful. All right. Your schema, for example, based on reading instruction or learning or whatever, is based on your personal experience. This is why change is so often hard to occur in an educational context in a school because we have these personal experiences. I knew a kid who I did this once and all right. These are schema based on our personal experiences. However, human survival is based on our ability to adapt adopt and adapt schema, adopt and adapt to physical and mental stimuli, adopt and adapt our schema when we encounter new physical stimuli out there in the world and mental stimuli in the terms of information. And remember, when we act upon the world, the world acts upon us, meaning that it changes the structure of our brain in terms of new neural pathways. All right. This old Piaget concept, assimilation, is when we are adding information to a new file or to an existing file. All right, this new information kind of corresponds with what we already know about spiders, so it's pretty easy to assimilate. Accommodation when occurs when you get new information and it doesn't match the file folder in your head, so you have to restructure the file folder. Or when you have a file folder or a schema, uh, that does not accommodate this new information, new information that is totally new to you. You have to accommodate. Here is a kind of uh, 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 an example, a, a, a illustration of what a schema might look like related to eggs. You see all the related information there. All knowledge that we have is constructed. It's not replicated. We don't look at reality and reflect it exactly in our head. We don't read and it's not re re replicated in our head. It's constructed, meaning we use the file folders based on our past knowledge and experiences that mixes with new information and we construct. So every person experiences an event, a text, a situation, and they all construct it just a little bit different based on their own experiences and knowledge. Comprehension, then, is constructing a schema that provides a coherent explanation of the things that we experience. It has to be coherent and it has to make sense. Comprehension is creating meaning. In learning and in reading, we like to use graphic organizers. These become an external form of the in internal structure of the schema. We use them as pre-reading or pre-lesson types of things so we can show students the structure of what is to be learned. This enables them to better encode and internalize that information. These are great during reading, during lesson, and post-reading and post-lesson activities as well. It becomes an external form of that internal structure. So, the functions of schema it provides a scaffolding to assimilate text information or any lesson information. Here's the scaffolding, here's the structure, and enables us to see the structure of that new information and how one thing relates to the X. Then the next. Schema facilitates the allocation of attention. You 
have the structure, you kind of know about a, a thing, so you know which things to pay attention to, which things are more important and less, what are the superordinate and subordinate categories, you know what to pay attention to. Schema enables you to go beyond the information there to elaborate, all right? Since you have a basic file folder in your head, it doesn't have to spell out everything in the text or in the lesson. You're able to fill in the blanks. And schema enhances memorizing and summarizing. You have this nice structure, this nice file folder to put the new information around. It's not just a mishmash of unrelated facts and things. So that enables you to memorize and to summarize. Reading and schemata. Now realize that when you are reading, the brain is analyzing stimuli on many levels. You're looking at the letter sounds, graphophonemic. You're looking at word parts, more themes, the smallest uh, unit of meaning. Word parts, roots, prefix, suffixes. You're also looking at context clues, semantics. Syntax, that's grammar and word order. And pragmatics, the context that is found in. For example, it was a long run. The meaning of that depends on the context. It could be a long run in the stocking, a long home run, a long running run, all right? So pragmatics is part of analyzing stimuli or analyzing the message. Text analysis is interpreted. Text is analyzed and interpreted on the basis of hypothesis testing. Remember, in reading, nine times more information is flowing from the cortex down than from the thalamus up. That means information is constantly going up. We're predicting what the next sentence might be or what the meaning might be. And then we're using uh, cues, letter cues, to confirm or reconstruct uh, the meaning. So reading is an interactive process. What is in the head mixes with what is on the page, but mostly we are hypothesis testing. We are predicting. Ken Goodman calls it a psycholinguistic guessing game. We guess and then we use text clues to confirm our guess or change our hypothesis. So the implications for your teaching is are these. You need to pre-teach concepts to build requisite knowledge. Very rarely should you have students read things cold. That is, they know nothing about it. Here it is. Read the text. You need to build that. You'll always need to integrate new to known. This is what you know. This is how this new stuff relates to what is known. You need to highlight the structures of the material to be learned or read. That's why I like the graphic organizer or simple outline. It's called an advanced organizer. Anything that shows the structure of what is to be read or learned is an advanced organizer. And knowing that providing packets of factoids, little things here, there, limits learning. If you try to cover too much, you end up covering up what is to be learned. All the research I've looked at on learning says that you need to cover less information more deeply. So think in terms of carrots with lots of roots instead of just covering a whole bunch of facts. Sometimes when we talk too much, we end up providing too much information. Sometimes when we teach too much, we end up creating a less meaningful experience. All learning, all reading is about creating meaning. Here's a real simple activity that you can do for expository text. I call it 3 to one It's similar to KWL or KQL. Before reading or a lesson, what are three things you know about? Insert topic here. And in a large group, you can actually list those on the board. What are two questions you have about? Insert topic to be read about or learned there. You read the text to do the lesson. And then what is one thing you learned about? afterwards and the students identify something that is interesting or important. I like to call it three to one because it provides structure. All right, that has just been some information on schema theory, learning and comprehension. When we sum up this episode, once more we can remember that the schema theory was introduced by Sir Frederick Charles Burlett in 1932 and further developed in the 70s by Richard Anderson. Barlett suggested that human beings apparently possess generic knowledge in the form of unconscious mental structures or schemata and that these structures produce 
schematized errors in recall when they interact with incoming information. Thus, it is through schemata that all knowledge influences new information.